everything routine about you is great. And Father, we know that you are with us. With all that's happening, Lord, in the nation and the nations of the world, your eyes upon the righteous. You have all this under control because you allowed it. So we thank you, Father. And once again, as we come in your presence, we pray that you speak your heart to us and give us your mind through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Whilst you are still standing, let's open our Bibles to the book of 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 to 13. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 to 13. And as you open, I'm preaching to an empty church. A few of us are here, obviously, to mark for generations that are coming that there was a time in April. There was a time in April when all nations came to a standstill and there was a lockdown because of a virus that had plagued nations of the world. As I speak to you today, about 90,000 all over the world have lost their lives. And all of us, uh, even in this service today, we say to you, the families affected, our hearts are with you, and we know that the Lord will give you strength to pass through this difficult time. We also want to urge everyone um, to call upon the name of the Lord. The Bible says, call upon me. And I know uh, that God will give us the grace to pass through this very difficult time. Um, we thank God some nations, are, they are, their caves are now flattening. We really thank God for that. And uh, we know that the hand of the Lord is upon you, uh, the nations of the world. I want to stress that this is not the end of the world. Um, as I said before, this is not the end of the world. Don't ever fool yourself that way. These are signs of the times. And uh, it's for us to call upon the name of the Lord, to tend to God. And when God allows things like that, it's for us to tend to him. Now we know there's a supreme being somewhere. Amen. Now, I'm, I'm going to preach and, uh, during Passover. This is the time of Easter. And I'm going to preach this time where Easter comes to us at a very difficult time. But once uh, we preached about what happened at Passover, the Jewish people, they take Passover to be a very important time when they remember how they delivered from Egypt. And uh, for us Christians, we really know that it also marks the time when our Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary for our sins. And uh, there was that Passover so that we were delivered from the bondage of the enemy. And that time, the Son of God died on the cross of Calvary. So I want to read this portion of scripture which I've taken to really teach throughout Easter on the importance of what happened at Calvary. But I'm, I'm going to entitle the message a bit different. Uh, so let's read from 1 John chapter 5, 4 to 13. John the Revelator is the last of the apostles in his writing. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood. If you can underline there, he is the one who came by water and blood. Even Jesus Christ and then there's an emphasis, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that bears witness because the spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth. The Spirit the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness 
of God which he has testified of his son. And this is the testimony, verse 11, that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. The last verse I'm reading is verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated in his presence. When your father dies and leaves a huge estate inheritance for you, you cannot just invert that inheritance uh, among many other children. You must prove be, before a competent court that you are the rightful heir to the estate. Before the judge, you must produce evidence or witnesses that stand for you. Uh, it can be a will or persons the bottom line is there has to be witnesses. When the Apostle John wrote the text above and indeed the first epistle, which was a, a general epistle, there had arisen heretics during that time who were disputing the divinity of Jesus Christ. The, the Gnostics, for instance, were saying Jesus Christ did not suffer on the cross. They argued when the dove came upon him when he was being baptized, it did not remain on him. It left. And so when he finally went to the cross and added to all this that the dove was no longer on him, he suffered under, you know, the, the, the Jews and the Romans and they, 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 they battered him. They, and God cannot succumb to such human uh, persecution. That means there was no any efficacy in his death finally on the cross. They, they argue the ion or divine being that dwelt in the man Christ, the divine being that dwelt in the man Jesus Christ had left him when he was taken by the Jews. And he being but a mere man on the cross he was nothing. His death has no, has no merit. It means nothing. There was also confusion. Some were actually saying that the, the, the death of Jesus Christ did not have any efficacy. Why? Because he, God would not come in, the, in flesh. He would not come in flesh. God is spirit. So if you say that God came in the flesh, then you are, you are, you, 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 you are missing the point. But God will not come in the flesh. Others tend to believe only his power to heal. And uh, just as others who believed in other gods did in, 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 during that time. And yet others also said he was just a great prophet. Uh, but not the Son of God. And I want to say to you today that all over the world there's no dispute that Jesus Christ was a great prophet and that also he was a great teacher of the word. And uh, from Islam to Judaism, there's no problem with that. But to say that he was the Son of God, that is where the problem is. That is where the contention is. Now, at close to about 100 years after the death of Jesus Christ, most of the apostles had gone. They'd passed on. And we only had just the apostle John. He was the one who was still alive during that time. John being the only apostle who walked with Jesus Christ, who was now still alive, came to our rescue by meticulously writing and giving us witnesses that would witness that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and Savior of the world. So during this particular unique Easter holiday, I'm teaching on a message I have entitled, The Four Witnesses. 
This message will be divided into two heavenly witnesses and earthly witnesses. Second Corinthians chapter 13 from verse 1, the Bible says, talking about witnesses, every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And so they, 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 even the Jews knew about this. There has to be at least two or three witnesses to settle a matter. Heavenly witnesses. I want you to get a picture whereby you, we are here on earth and there are beings in heaven and we all believe that God created the heavens and the earth and at a certain time the devil was cast down here and obviously being the first one who comes here down here he tells stories about heaven he lies about exactly where we came from and he lies about who we are and he has had time before Jesus Christ the second being from heaven would come here on earth I want you to picture see that that it was a, a difficult time to really then prove that the second person who is coming here on earth Jesus the son of the living God is actually the son of God and everything the devil has been saying is a lie. Now in our portion of scripture, uh, verse number 9, I'm talking of First John chapter 5, um, the, the scripture that we are going to follow throughout. The, the ninth verse says, if we receive the witness of man, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he has testified of his son, he who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. That means the eternal life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So the issue in the spiritual courts here is whether Jesus Christ is the Son of God and therefore Savior of the world. For this we need, first of all, three witnesses in heaven and they have to provide. They have to be provided, they have to be given Else your salvation story comes to nothing. We had to have three witnesses from heaven. Not less. Three witnesses from heaven to authenticate that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Because the Bible has said there, the witness of God is supreme. The witness of God is greater. Remember, before Jesus was sent from glory as a deliverer, Someone had already come, like I said from the beginning, the devil. So obviously Lucifer himself had lied a lot. And he had actually glued people to worshipping idols. And, 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 and so that people would believe that by worshipping animals, we can actually get our relationship with God back again. It was during that same time that Jesus then comes on the second, on the scene. Secondly, we need three witnesses here on earth that then remain with us here all the days of our lives to constantly remind us that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so we would then have three witnesses in heaven and three witnesses here on earth. And then out of these would then emerge a fourth witness. And I'll talk about the fourth witness. I can picture see John saying, I am the last of the apostles. And I have been testifying about Jesus Christ, but I'm about to go. However, do not worry. There are witnesses that will be with you always. The first group in heaven has already agreed, but now there will be three witnesses that will be with you all the time. And they will remind you that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and therefore the Savior of the world. And so we look at the, 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 the divine, the triune uh, uh, God, and we start with the Father. 
The Bible says in Matthew chapter 3, when Jesus Christ had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly, a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now I want you to know that the playing around with water, the Jews had no problem with that. That's why even when John was writing, he said, Not by water only, but by blood. Because he knew they did not have a problem with water. So the authentication that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, as God authenticated when he was being baptized, that one was not a problem with, with the Jews. It was not a problem at all because they knew about the, uh, the issue of cleansing, water cleansing and all that. It was not a problem to them. The issue of blood was the problem. And Matthew chapter 17 then says again, now after six days, Jesus took up Peter, James, and John. And this is the time when they went to the Mount uh, Transfiguration. And I'll jump there. I'll get to, um, to four, where Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles. He was a bit confused. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, the fifth verse says, Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. That means the father was speaking, authenticating and saying, He is my son. And then we go to be the word, because the Bible says in the heavenlies there are three witnesses, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Let's go to the Word. And we're still with our verse, which is uh, 1 John chapter 5, and I'm reading verse 7. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And we also get this from the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning, the, 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 in the beginning, God created the heavens of the earth. And the Hebrew word there for God was Elohim, which is plural. which is talking about not one God, but it's one God in three. It's not like a singular father standing on his own, but one God in three. And so, John chapter 1, John chapter 1, if, you, if, you are, if you've got your Bible, you're reading. John chapter 1 from verse 1. I'm going to read uh, a little bit here up to 14. In the beginning was the word. That means now there's the authentication of the word itself. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life. Now, that's the eternal life we're talking about. Amen. The eternal life. In him was life, and the life was the light of the world. Remember in 1 John chapter 5, we said that eternal life is in the sun. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not compre comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not the light but was sent to be a witness of the light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world. We're still talking about the word. And the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own. That means he really literally walked here on earth. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. He's talking about the Jewish people. Did not, did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but of God. I will repeat verse 12. Very, very insightful, very important scripture. 
and verse 18, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That means we're born of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. That means he walked amongst us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That means the word came and be with us. And when we talk about that, now we are talking about Jesus becoming flesh, walking amongst us. That means the word talked about here is actually Jesus, the Son of God. Amen. John 14, Thomas he had some doubts. John 14 from verse 5 up to verse 10. He says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. And how can we know the way? He's talking to Jesus. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. In other words, he's saying the works themselves are a witness. Believe me for that. Mark chapter 14 from verse 61 to 62. But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said to him, Are you the Christ? the son of the blessed or the son of God. And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the son of God, of man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. I am. Now we have we've come to the word. The Bible says the father, the word, and the Holy Spirit agree in heaven. And we have seen through God's word how the, the three agree. We will, we will finally come to the Holy Spirit. But before I get there, Isaiah chapter 7, 14, that's the Old Testament now, it all, 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 already talked about him. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So, the world doubts now and say that is he really the son of God? Now we've got three witnesses in heaven and we've actually seen that the son or the word is actually authenticated and the word of God says in, in the book of John chapter 1 in the beginning was the word, the word was with God. Now let's get to the Holy Spirit. John chapter 15 verse 26 but when the helper comes whom I shall send to you, this is Jesus speaking, from the Father. The spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. That means when the Holy Spirit comes, he will testify of me. Matthew chapter 3 from verse 15, 16. When he had been baptized... Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. That means the Spirit of God comes and alights on him to authenticate that he is the Son of God. The, the, the dove the, the come, comes there in the, is kind of like a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So you cannot divide the three. The three are one and they authenticate 
that he is the son of God. And even when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost and, 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 and they started to speak in other tongues, he was also coming in to authenticate that whom you have believed in is actually the son of God. And because it had already been prophesied in the book of Joel. The book, of, uh, the book that we are following first, John chapter 5, you can go back to there and I want you to go to verse number 8. I'm now talking about the earthly witnesses. Now we have seen heavenly beings authenticating that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And now we want to talk about the earthly uh, witnesses. So to seal this matter, God provided evidence on earth to witness Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. In our text in 1 John chapter 5, verse 8, and there are three that bear witness on earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. Like I said from the beginning, I want you to know that this same confusion is still there today. The Gnostics had no problem with Jesus getting baptized, but they had a problem uh, with the issue of his death. His death being anything that could save humanity. That, that is the problem which is still there today. It's like, did his death have any, any merit? Did it have any significance? After all, the divine had left him. In other words, they were approving that the divine came on him when he was being baptized in the form of a dove. They are proof of that, but they've got an argument that it left him. It did not remain on him. And when the Jews took him and they were uh, uh, ill-treating him and the, and the, the Romans were beating him with the, those 39 stripes and they were beating him, taking him to the cross, he was powerless. He was nobody. The dove did not come on him on that time. They've got that argument that no, he, that he was not the son of God. Good man, he was a prophet, he was a teacher, but a, a great teacher for that matter. And, 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 and as far as the cleansing of water, you, you know, as they would do for the priests, there's no problem with that. But when we talk about his death, having any merit or efficacy to deliver anyone then they had a problem, and there are so many that have got problems today about that. Verse 6 says, this is he that came by water. Even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that bears witness, because the spirit is truth. John is repeating something that already happened. In answering the question, who is the son of God? He says, it is he who came by water. That means in, in 1 John chapter 5, he's actually talking of another, an incident that happened. And I'm convinced that we have to open John chapter 19 to really understand this. Or John chapter 19, verse 31 to 35. John chapter 19, 31 to 35. And we now come... Um, to Passover, we come to the time of Easter. By the way, the word Easter has got so many meanings. Actually, some were saying is the German word for East and all that. And some were saying that Easter is the word that signifies the God of fertility and all that. But I like when, you know, it coincides with the Passover of the Jews. Then really it makes sense because... We're then talking about the time when God delivered the children of Israel. And uh, by the way, that Passover, for them, they were speaking in shadows. But for us, it's the substance now. When we have the real ultimate lamp going to the cross. To us, it's now substance. Amen. To them, it was shadows. But to us, it's substance. So, it's a great time that we have for the time of Easter when the Son of Man was... Uh, was crucified on the cross and, and when he was crucified something happened something happened 
John chapter 19 verse 31 to 35. Now it was the day of preparation and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jew, Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down because they were just close to Sabbath. They did not want the bodies to be there and they said break the legs and so that they die quickly. Uh, the soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first men who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. Verse 33, but when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead. And by the way, this is fulfillment of scripture. This was fulfillment of scripture that no one breaks his bones. And so when they found out that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony. This is John. And his testimony is true. It's like John is, is, is pleading for us to understand. He's, he's anxious for us to understand. He knows he's the last of the apostles to really testify this happened. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. This happened. They, they speared his side and water and blood gushed out. Hallelujah. Water and blood gushed out. By the way, I want you to understand this. When they were crucifying and the people were on the cross, most of the people would actually fight. You see, because the nails were on their hands, they would fight to elevate themselves so, so that they don't die quickly. Because if you, if you let go, and then obviously then the blood is, uh, I mean, the, the, the heart is affected and the person dies quickly from, from accumulation of water in, in, in the heart and they die quickly. So what they would do, the people would do this to remain on the cross. So you, you, you see what it means now because the first one managed to keep raised up. The second criminal managed to keep his hands uh, stretched out so that his body could remain high and not die quickly. But when they came to Jesus, because you remember he said that no one takes my life, I lay it down for my brother. He, had, he was already gone. He was already gone. Water and blood gushed out. I strongly feel this detail of water coming out together with blood was not just to show that Jesus was dead. Because the soldier had already seen that he was dead. Right. It was a detail for everyone to see that Jesus was the Messiah. Mm. Hallelujah. Yeah. He was the Messiah. Because I know there are scholars who believe that, uh, no, 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 no. Jesus Christ did not, you know, when he was on the cross of Calvary, when, when they pierced his side, they were trying to prove that. He, he, was he really dead and all that. But I really believe that it was to show that water and blood would come out. That detail, no other gospel writer put it except John. John was saying, you can't miss this detail. It's not about trying to kill Jesus. No, they've already said he was dead. It was a detail to show that there is an importance to the water and the blood. And never skip that. I know there are many who say it's not important, but never skip that because it's an important detail. Because where we are reading from our, from our, from our scripture, we, we heard it very clearly that he is, who is the son of God? He is the one who came by water and blood. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And um, I pause here to ask you a question. Why do you think this is important given what the Gnostics were saying, given those who did not believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, why was it important to include it there? It was important to include it there 
For two reasons. First of all, for everyone to see that Jesus was flesh and blood. Hallelujah. He was flesh and blood. And also, for us then to see that if he was flesh and blood, that means he came by, he came in the flesh. And I'll show you how important this is. He came as flesh. Because remember, they were fighting to say, no, he did not come as flesh. God cannot come as flesh. Because if then we would say, he did not come as flesh, then we would say at the end, then he, his blood had no power to deliver anyone. He had no power to deliver anyone. He says, dear friends, do not believe every spirit. First John chapter 4 verse 1. Do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And verse 2 says, this is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. They literally refuse to accept incarnation of Christ. This is the problem. If they had argued, and some are still arguing, that, and win the argument in your heart, child of God, where you are seated, wherever you are, and win that, uh, that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh, then the whole thing of incarnation is null and void. It's null and void. That means when even Isaiah shouted as a prophet, and he said, God will give you a sign. A virgin shall be with child. And shall call him Emmanuel. Which means Elohim in men. That verse would not count. So the issue, the problem here at Easter is, did he really die in the flesh? Now I want you to know both Blood and water, which came out of him, his side, actually showed that he was a human being in flesh. Right. Are you hearing me? He was a human being in flesh. And then, if you agree with that, then we go to the next thing. You are great.